Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It's a great privilege and honor to be here with you. Um, but first, I should start off by asking you a couple of questions. What do you call somebody who speaks many languages? Multilingual. What do you call somebody who speaks two languages? Bilingual. What do you call somebody who speaks one language? An American. <laughs> and unfortunately, I fit in the stereotype. Um, I regret to say that English is my only language. Some people question that I'm even able to do that. So uh, I, I regret that I'll have to speak in English to you today. Again, it is a pleasure to be here. And particularly the remarkable transformation this country has gone through. Um, I should point out the last time I was here it was September 11th, 2001. We were having a meeting of the Mount Florence Society here. And then the unfortunate events happened. And uh, the meeting, of course, did not continue. And all of us are trying to scramble to get back to the U.S. So I hope today, being here, we will not have a momentous event as we had the last time I was here. Um, I was also mentioned to my colleagues here that um, President Klaus of the Czech Republic is an old friend of mine. He's you know, known to the Mount Florence Society I'm back, I guess, about 1989 or so. And before he took office, he was very bold in how we should do transformations. And he wasn't accused of treatment and myself of being too far to the left. Then, of course, he took office things didn't turn out quite the way he uh, talked before he took office. And then, first he told us the split wouldn't happen in the country, and then of course it did. And then he told us uh, the Czechs would do a whole lot better than do Slovaks, and then that turned out not to be the case. And um, so occasionally I, I, I say probably once a year or so, I'm here, it like the needle in the whole thing about the great success that you have made of your country here in the last few years. Over the last 60 years, we have seen virtually every form of political and economic system that could be devised by the man, mind of man, man tribe. Um, and of course, here, you have experienced many of these great experiments. Fascism, communism, with socialism, and now, of course, you move to free market democratic capitalism, and that is because the world, at least the thinking world, those who understand history, understand that free people, free markets, democratic capitalism, with all of its imperfections, and there are many imperfections, but it is far less imperfect than any other system has ever been devised by the man, mind of man. And a beautiful thing about democratic capitalism, it's not a system, actually, uh, Marx labeled capitalism. It is what Hayek would say, the spontaneous order. It is what people naturally do. They produce, they trade, uh, they work to improve their properties, uh, and people like freedom. Today, I was going to talk about what I call the 10 uh, rules of economic growth. Again, you have achieved much of this in this country. But what we have learned is something Ronald Reagan used to try to teach us. Is first, you have to tell people, and we expect all of you to be free market missionaries. It means you have to go out there and you've got to explain it to them. First, you tell them what you're going to tell them. Then you tell them. Then you tell them what you told them. And you do it over and over and over again because politicians all over the globe forget. Some of them forget the matter of days. Back in 1978 in the United States, we had our first major what we call supply side cut. That was the capital gains tax cut. And uh, I was very much involved with the effort. And as an arrogant young man, I thought, oh, we have taught the world a lesson particularly our U.S. politicians, and they would not, of course, ever again increase capital gains taxes because 
because we show that we cut the rate, we increase the revenue. Well, uh, how, um, how wrong I was. By 1986, the Congress again was increasing the rate. Then they brought it down, it's gone up and down a number of times. We now have it down to 15%. It's worked very well. But the lesson here is if you assume you teach a politician or a journalist or anybody uh, some good economics, if you don't repeat it time and time again, uh, they'll forget. And so what we're trying to do around the globe now with our Center for Global Economic Growth is create what we call free market missionaries, people who will go out there day in and day out and deal with the politicians and the press, and when they get things wrong, remind them what is right, because if you don't, you'll be surprised how quickly they'll regress, they'll forget how the old things didn't work, and next thing you know, they'll be increasing taxes and regulations and all the other things which stifle economic growth. And the first is to establish the rule of law. Without the rule of law, virtually nothing else works. I was the uh, co-chairman of the Bulgarian Economic Transition Team back in 1990. And one big mistake we made then, we put a great deal of emphasis on privatization. And coming from sort of our Anglo-Saxon American background, we thought, well, if you privatize it, of course the courts will enforce property because we were used to having basically honest judges in an honest judicial system. And we did not understand the level of corruption that was, uh, existed in Bulgaria at that time. In fact, Bulgaria still suffers from too much corruption. So a lot of things were privatized, but it didn't make a whole lot of difference because if you could buy outcomes by paying off the judge, you didn't accomplish what you set out to accomplish. So the rule of law and having an honest judiciary is absolute key, and without that, it's hard to do anything else. The second basic thing is protection of private property. Think in your own cases. Um, would you invest, let's say you have a small farm, would you invest in new irrigation systems and all the things you need to do to improve the farm if you were uncertainty about your ownership? Probably not. We know that when private property is protected, people invest more in it, they work harder, they improve it. And we think of, the, again, the family farm, traditional farm. In the modern world, though, <coughs> when we talk about protection of property, that's big companies. Um, and it can be everything from a service business like a restaurant to a manufacturing company. And if you do not protect rights, the property rights of the stockholders, even though that seems to be more somewhat from the company, um, you will not have the levels of investment you need to expand and grow. And there's an awful lot of countries around the world say, well, <clears throat> yeah, we'll protect this property, maybe the small businessman, but you know, we're going to um, maybe seize control of large businesses or take control. We see what's happening in Russia retrogression there. This is not going to have a good long-term outcome. They're getting away with it now because of the high oil prices and high commodity prices. But we know these things go in cycles, and when the cycle goes down, they're going to very much regret having done this because it's inefficiency that's going back in, and production growth is diminishing, as it always is, under state ownership and state control. Another important area of private property is intellectual property. And it's important to protect things like computer software, any kinds of inventions, all kinds of intellectual property, drugs, uh, new pharmaceuticals, anything. And if you don't adequately protect them, you won't have the kind of investment and new entrepreneurial activity you need to grow the society. Another key thing is remove all price controls. I understand basically you have done that here in Slovakia. Um, it always amazes me that we have now over 2,000 years of failures every time a price control is established. Prices are information. It is what you need to motivate future production, to allocate scarce resources. And when you control prices, 
you're denying yourself the information you need for a properly functioning economy. Um, the Roman Emperor Diocletian, in about AD 100, was one of the first recorded attempts of price controls. They failed. Politicians continually they try them. They always fail. They always end up causing shortages, um, misallocation of resources. And in the U.S., when we had the gasoline prices go up over the past year, sure enough, we had a few politicians get up and said we needed controls. What that showed me, these people were totally ignorant of history and ignorant of economics. Uh, but any time any politician wants to control any price, you have to go after these people and explain what a price is. And if you control the price, um, you just won't get the product if you have too low a price on it. <coughs> Free trade. Uh, again, here is a lesson I think Slovakia has learned. Adam Smith, the first really recognized great economist, understood free trade was important because it increases the extent of the market. That means you have many more potential buyers. And these additional potential buyers um, allow you to get more production efficiencies if you're doing more and more buying. Then David Ricardo explained the whole theory of comparative advantage, and I won't go through all that today. But basically, economists have known for 200 years that free trade is the ideal model. Now I realize, going, you know, being part of the EU, you're now restricted. You have a reasonable free trade within the European Union, but the um, barriers the European Union has to the outside world are counterproductive. Um, again, agriculture is a prime example of um, destructive policies we have in the U.S. to a lesser extent than you do here in, in Europe. But you must always work towards free trade. It's hard sometimes because when you have free trade, you can almost see the particular business that lost a market because of having lower priced foreign goods come in. But you don't see all the employment gains that you get from trade. Um, well, for instance, in the U.S., we get a huge quantity of Chinese mer uh, merchandise. Do you get a lot here? One thing I point out is a company called Walmart. Do you have any Walmart stores here? Walmart is the world's most efficient, largest and most efficient retailer. And I can go in and buy perfectly good men's underwear, undershorts, um, undershirts in Walmart, good quality, Made in China for a lower price than it costs to have me clean, have them clean in leading European hotels like this one. That's the beauty of the market. It's the beauty of free trade. Now, when you buy inexpensive, say, clothing from China, you say, well, that hurts local clothing manufacturers. But everybody in Slovakia who buys that has, in effect, a real increase in income. Because suddenly, if the price of your shirt is half of what it used to be, you're that much better off. And it's hard for people to see the increase in the general welfare, but it's easy to identify the person who lost the job and had a plan. But we know in virtually all cases, free trade benefits the society. Limit government spending. <clears throat> About 20 years ago, I was looking at um, rates of economic growth and the size of government. Now this, the data here is a bit out of date and there's some people, some other accounts who are now updating this. This is labeled by Forbes magazine when I first wrote it up. Um, it's called the Ron Curve. But the, um, the relationship is as government grows as a share of GNP, up to some point, uh, you have higher growth. For instance, if you have no government at all, um, you won't have the, the proper court system, the rule of law, the basic infrastructure you need, basic protection of 
health, education. But once government starts to get bigger and does things the private sector can do better, economic efficiency falls off and economic growth slows. And if you look just around the world now, the high growth economies, for the most part, have smaller governments than the low growth economies. Europe, we have a beautiful example of Ireland, where Ireland had high taxes and big government sector. It's been shrinking it for a number of years. And it went from about the lowest income country on a capita basis in Europe to the second highest after Luxembourg in only 20 years. A remarkable change. Um, I see here in Central Europe that many of the countries have smaller government sectors than do France and Germany and Italy, which are mired in economic stagnation. Um, the U.S. total size of government is about a third smaller than what we have in what we call old Europe, again, France, Germany, and Italy. And the U.S. economic performance has been far, far better than growing up. Uh, two or three times as rapidly as the old countries in Europe. Um, I look at you all as new countries. You're on that high growth track. But in part of this, you can bring down the size of government. We've got to continue to do that. Every year, you've got to hack the government because governments always lead to inefficiency. And probably if you get the size, local, federal, state, you know, all your government units in total down to under 20% of your GDP, you will maximize economic growth. If you're going at 5%, you're going to have a problem because you're going to be doing the basic things you need to. But history, looking around the world, um, bigger governments, governments can get too big. I have noticed over the years, though, that there are some exceptions to a point. Now, take Finland is a very interesting exception. The Finns have been able to maintain a higher size of bigger government, this percentage of GDP, than most other countries can to maintain the same level of economic growth. That must have a comparison between Sweden and, uh, and Switzerland, but Finland's even a better example. Because the Finns, I looked at them, I've spent time in Finland. They're a very homogeneous population, small, they operate more like a club. In larger or heterogeneous states, you seem to have to have smaller government to get the same level of growth that you do in small homogeneous states. Limit taxation. Clearly, this is a, a lesson that is being learned well in Slovakia. Um, rather than being a follower, you're one of the world's leaders in the flat tax. We know that high marginal tax rates discourage growth. People do not work, save, and invest to pay taxes. You all know that people go to great extents, so legally and illegally, to find ways to avoid paying taxes. Um, the evidence is that taxes on capital should be zero. That's on interest savings, uh, interest given as capital gains. In fact, the first day we mentioned they're taxed a lot more than zero but we would maximize economic welfare. Um, and there's been a number of studies that very well demonstrate that. Um, on labor, tax rates above 20% over the long run tend to be counterproductive. If you need to tax, the best way to do it is tax consumption. And I know your combination of taxes here is still very high. And even though you put in the flat tax, still need to have a way to bring that down to the lower level, cut back on your value added. I know the European Union doesn't like cutting back on the value added, but it's gotten too high. Tax rates in general, about 15% uh, in most areas are counterproductive. I mean, some areas you don't have those higher tax rates like that cigarettes, and you can tax those up to the point where people will grow something else or roll their own or, you know, smoke grass or something. But, um, uh, but generally speaking, tax rates above 15% over the long run tend to be around. And this principle, even though Arthur Laffer is the one who is best known for it, 
because he explained it to Dick Cheney on a napkin in a Washington restaurant um, 30 years ago when Dick Cheney was uh, chief of staff for President Ford. When I was, yeah, he yeah, was back in about 1975 or so. Actually, the principle has been known for thousands of years. If you have a tax rate too high, that people will find really more really, really ways to avoid it. You can just not produce it. And many years ago, again, from the Tolerance Society, I was doing a paper looking at the origins of what we call supply side economics, which looks at the disincentive effects from high taxes. And one thing I found was a wonderful set of correspondence between J.P. Say, the great French economist, you know, Sunday economist. Saves the law. And Thomas Jefferson, uh, one of our founding fathers and president of the United States, about what the optimal rate of tax was on certain tariffs because they knew if the tariff tax got too high, you had domestic substitution or smuggling. And it was a wonderful exchange of letters, and we could see that the arguments and the debate has not really changed in 200 years. And wise men 200 years ago understood the distance of the effects of taxation. And what we're trying to do is make the more wise men today. Regulations. Regulations are a hidden tax. Um, and the planet is plagued with excess regulation from every government at every level in every country. We have too much regulation. The regulations reduce our liberties and in air, our ability to work, save, and invest. One of the boards I serve on is the Cayman Island Monetary Board. And we regulate the banks, the insurance companies, the mutual funds that produce money in Cayman. Now, some of you who read some of the novels think Cayman is a place where you know, drug dealers and people hide the money. In fact, it's very different. The reason people bring their money to Cayman because they've got very confident and honest banks and very honest government that there is no tax on the money uh, on, on income in the corporate or individual. And it's a very well-run jurisdiction. I was the first non comedian to be one of the regulators there. But anyway, we run probably one of the world's most efficient regulatory organizations. We do indeed oversee all these financial institutions. And the thing I noticed was we have to hire people to write regulations to do this. But once you hire somebody to write a regulation, and it can be in the smallest town, it can be in a provincial level, or the governmental level, or international organizations, these people to keep their jobs have to keep writing regulations. And when they write regulations, whether they're needed or not, and we even noticed we had too much of growth of regulation in Cayman's free market as it is. And so finally we started requiring every regulation to have a cost-benefit analysis done before it could be implemented. Uh, this is the true in every place you go. It's just the nature of government is to want to regulate and control. Um, in the United States, one of the big battles now, well first we had the battle over smoking. And those of you who've been to the United States in recent times know it's almost impossible to smoke in the country. Now, I haven't, personally, I've never been a smoker, and I don't like smoking, but I think people should have the freedom to smoke, because I believe in freedom. But we've gotten rid of most smoking in the U.S. So now the professional nannies, you know, people who want to control other people's lives, are focusing on food. Things like fast food, McDonald's, I noticed they've got a McDonald's right over here a couple blocks away, that evil McDonald's. There's lots of calories in McDonald's burgers and milkshakes and french fries. Some of these calories are not good calories and they clog up your arteries and they cause you to be fat or have heart attacks or other evils. But is it really the nature of the purpose of government to tell us you know, what we should and should not eat. I mean, you can give them, I don't care if they give advice to say some foods are better than others. But when they get in there and say, Peter, you shouldn't eat more than one piece of chocolate 
per week. You know, this is uh, this this kind of stuff is you know just takes away all the joy out of life, and it's uh, important we maintain these individual liberties. And uh, I mean, each one of us has things we would like other people to do. I mean, I'm, in my own life, I've often had other people improve at programs. Don't apply them to myself, but I'm quite willing to apply them to other people. Um, and I notice when people get in government and actually have powers of coerce other people to engage in what they consider a personal improvement program of what they should eat and what they should do and how they should walk and how they should dress and how they should comb their hair and so forth and so on, it never ends. And just, there's no simple solution here, but just keep up the visual battle against excess regulation, demand cost-benefit analysis, and demand that perhaps the test of not significantly reducing individual liberty. <coughs> Removing barriers to business formation. I know you've made a great deal of progress here in Slovakia on reducing these barriers. Uh, one of the problems that Europe in general has had is it's much harder to start new businesses in Europe than in the United States. And as a result, the United States benefits enormously from having all these entrepreneurial people around the world. In fact, it's not well known, but we have an enormous influx of Frenchmen who want to start businesses coming to the United States. You hear about Mexicans coming across the border, but you don't hear so much about all the French are coming in to start businesses because it's hard to do it in France. It's hard to do it in Germany. Um, in the U.S., if I want to start up a new business, and I've been a businessman, I've had a number of businesses, including a semiconductor company, and now I occasionally put together real estate partnerships or other businesses. <coughs> we can do this usually for an hour or two on the internet. I live in the state of Virginia now, and also do some things in Florida. Both states make it very easy. Just go on the internet, get a your form, get a tax ID number, which you get instantaneously. The whole total fees are a couple hundred dollars. Uh, you can either get a lawyer, which is cheap, or do it yourself for the most part. And you can set up a sole proprietorship, a partnership, a limited liability company, or a corporation. And you can do that in most places within a couple of hours, very quickly, for almost any type of business. Um, I went again, going back to Bulgaria, when I first did the transition there, we tried to put in these very simple procedures. Within a year or two, I suddenly noticed the Bulgarians had all these additional requirements, including a minimum capital requirement, something like $10,000. And I said, why in the world are doing this? And they said, well, the Germans told us to. And I said, what? And they said, well, the Germans told us you ought to have minimum capital because new businesses often fail. Most of them do fail, as a matter of fact, in every place. And they had to make sure there was enough money in there so they could pay the taxes. And I thought, this is really a sick way of looking at this. It. Totally backwards. Um, and it's no, I mean, you take a look at the rate of new business formation in Germany, which I understand, takes many weeks and costs a lot, versus that in the U.S. So you just want to make it just as easy as possible. I mean, if you're not doing internet business, setting it up, you also do Estonia has been a great leader in that. Mark Lahr, the Prime Minister of Estonia, put in this OP government. And I think jurisdictions around the world learn a lot from that. Particularly, and the U.S. does a lot of things for it, but one thing we do well is allow me to set up a business. If you got an idea, we can write it up one night, we can start off with $10 of capital, and you can go to business the next day. And it's wonderful. It creates enormous numbers of jobs. Um, in the 1970s, a lot of people from Southeast Asia, Vietnamese and Cambodians, poor people came into the U.S. These were extremely poor people. They, had, they didn't know the language. They, most of them had no money at all. But they had freedom in the U.S. And in Arlington, Virginia, near where I live, a number of them moved there. And they started off little businesses like they would, you know, have some fruits and vegetables they would sell on the streets. And pretty soon they'd save enough money to have a little store. And over time, the stores got bigger. And now these people have totally revitalized a lot of our shopping centers. We've got a lot of these 
all the old sort of rundown shopping centers totally modernized, like revitalized, dynamic, and owned and run by these Vietnamese and Cambodians. The dry cleaning business in Northern Virginia is almost totally run by Koreans who came over here. I have a little dry cleaning shop in, in, near my home. A Korean woman runs it. She is there six days a week, Monday through Saturday, from 7.30 in the morning to 7.30 in the evening, every day. We've been going for 20 years. Only a month ago did she miss a day, and that was because her daughter was getting her PhD. She went to school. Just trick. And you see this happen time and time again, because you can't freedom, and these people work. This woman, she says it's so hard for the first generation, but the second generation, the one born there, they can go out and build these businesses and get into professions. And that freedom to start businesses, I can't say enough how important that is, and gets anybody, no matter what their background was, no matter how poor, how little education is, an opportunity to maximize their own individuality and well-being. Courage ownership. Ownership is wonderful. It's important for people to own their own homes. United States, 70% of the population actually owns the homes they're in. Single family houses, condos, all kinds of uh, structures. When people own things, they take good care of it. I well, you, you all know this because I looked at the remarkable transformation having spent a fair amount of time in uh, this area of the world, in Russia, before under the old communist system and saw how terrible a bunch of the housing was and how quickly it got revitalized and people could actually own things and take care of them and improve them. Uh, and ownership leads to a civil society. Expanding ownership is absolutely key. And the United States has done a lot of things wrong, but one thing it did is put a great deal of emphasis and made it easy for people to own homes and again own businesses. And we work very hard to try to get the minority groups, you know, um, American blacks and others, to have high ownership rates. When people own things, they gain capital. And that's the formation of, you know, if you own things, you've got something to lose. If you don't own anything, so if you go burn somebody's place down, or you own your own place, it doesn't make any difference. And again, ownership leads to economic development and the civil society. Finally, the use of sound money. Um, I'm a great believer in competitive currencies, allowing people to use any currency they want. Obviously, government has to have some currency that it pays its bills and pays its taxes. Um, this is not so much a problem any longer. 25 years ago, we had high inflation in much of the world, and people were restricted from using the competitive currency. The euro has actually performed much better than actually I thought it would. Um, I worry, though, the problem I think we're going to face overall with the euro. And I don't know when this unraveling will take place. But look at the situation now, where the European Central Bank has to honor the bonds produced, the euro denominated bonds produced by the various countries. So you have Italy running huge deficits, deficits about 4.5% of their current budget. But the more dangerous thing is their debt GDP ratio. Their debt GDP ratio is about 113% at the moment. Um, Germany and, and uh, France, I think, are up about 48%. The US is 33%. But the, if you have countries like Italy running these big deficits, um, who is buying the bonds? Well, the European banks, because they're all treated at par, whether it's uh, a bond produced by the Italians or the Germans or the French or the Dutch or anybody else. So the Dutch have been following the treaty. They have not been running deficits. They have been saving and borrowing the bonds, and buying the bonds. And the Italians 
on the other side, they've been living very well at the expense of the Dutch. And as over the last few months, I've been in both the Netherlands and Italy, and I talk to people about this. And Italians sort of laugh, and they say, yeah, we know it's wrong, but we're enjoying it. And Dutch are saying, we know it's wrong, and we're grumpy about it. And at some point, the Dutch will get fed up, and they'll say, we're no longer going to be supporting the Spencer Italians. Anyway, I see this as a real problem uh, with the Euro, because if the Italians and lesser extent the French and Germans get away with it, then other countries will then say, well, we're going to be less fiscally responsible. And you have too many, and at some point, the whole thing unwinds, even though we get to central bank management. You can't sustain that forever. What I'd like to do now is take any questions. Um, I'm happy to do virtually anything on global economics, and even politics. And uh, if you have criticism of the US, I'm happy to hear them. And I've got a lot of my own. And uh, if there's things you have questions about, please fire away. And if you disagree with anything I've said, you know, go after me. I'm not, uh, I'm not thin-skinned. If you think I'm dead wrong on something, tell me.